Okay, let's uh, first uh, start. Um, first, thank you for participants this roundtable series. So the great divergence, law, justice, and empire in comparative perspective is sponsored by University of Notre Dame and Hong Kong Baptist University. In particular, we are sponsored by the Liu Institute for Asian, Asian Studies. Notre Dame International History Department of University of Notre Dame. And in Hong Kong, Baptist University was specially sponsored by Zhao Zongyi Guo Xue Yuan. Thanks for the institutional support. Without them, you know, this kind of round table could not be possible. So it's, this kind of round table is all collective efforts, but also is an experiment. So we try to organize uh, one or two round tables each semester, focus on topics such as justice, origins of law or legal practice. So each round table ideally would consist of three scholars. One scholar is an expert of Chinese history. One scholar is an expert of Western history, and the discussant is a scholar of law or political science and the social energy. So it, we would like to, you know, announce uh, this kind of round table uh, one month before the event date. So we will also provide our abstract elaborating major themes also provide a reading list of bibliography for potential audiences. So hope through this kind of series, we want to uh, uh, you know, achieve three major goals. One is we do want to collect the research of Chinese empires, especially early imperial China to the research for other civilizations. Second, we want to bridge historical research with other fields, such as the law, political science, social energy, and philosophy. The third is we want to take advantage of this kind of virtual or online format. Not only we try to create a global intellectual forum for Notre Dame and the Hong Kong Baptist University, also we try to reach larger audiences. So this today, the particular thing is concentrated on the punishment and the crime in Rome and early Chinese empires. So I'd like to introduce our three presenters, two speaker and the one discussant. Let me allow me to share the screen. The title today is called uh, The Law of Law for What? Crime and Punishment in Classic China and Rome. We have two uh, presenters. Uh, the first presenter is Professor Karen Turner. Karen Turner is a distinguished professor of humanities and history at the College of Holy Cross. Right now, she is a senior research fellow at Harvard Law School. I just want to introduce some anecdotes. Uh, Professor Turner actually studied with Professor Tian Yuqing at Beijing University in the late 1970s. Right now, her research on law is a masterate for students of Imperial China. So I want to say learning or pursuit of knowledge transcend the boundaries of national National, physical national boundaries also transcend the ethnic identities. So our second uh, presenter is Professor Peter Ban. He's an associate professor at the University of Copenhagen. He's a very proliferate scholar of Rome's empire, also leading scholar in the field of comparative studies. So he has uh, several books. Uh, compiled uh, and published by Oxford Cambridge University uh, to compare 
the Western civilization with the Eastern civilizations. Uh, I strongly encourage you to check out his website. Our discussant uh, is Professor Zhang Tai Shu at Yale Law School. Uh, Professor Zhang is uh, concentrated on the comparative legal and economic history. And his book, first book, The Law and Economics of Confucianism, Kinship and Property in Pre-Industrial China and England, was published by Cambridge University Prize press and received the 2018 President's Award from the Social Science History Association and the other book prize. So this series uh, on round table of you know, comparative law justice actually also inspired by another series organized by Pro Professor Tai Shu Zhang. So with Professor Li Chen at the University of Toronto, they organize an international speaker series, Rethinking Cultural Construction of Law in East Asian. So I, uh, you know, that kind of format uh, really attract large audiences and try to bring people interested in Chinese history and Chinese law together on Zoom. So without further ado, I would like to, you know, uh, give the round table to our speakers. So the, our first speaker would be Professor Turner. I'm recording this from Worcester, Massachusetts on May 3rd, 2021. I've titled the talk, Law and Love in Han China, The Emperor's Two Faces. I want to focus on the dual role of the Han emperors enmeshed in ties of affection and clan politics, but also responsible for the functioning of the legal system. We see in these examples the push and pull between patrimonial and bureaucratic ideologies and practices, a common theme in traditional tributary empires. My first goal today was to find a workable measure to look at the rule of law in China as a tributary empire. Secondly, I wanted to look at the historical contexts of materials, not just those coming from the ground in China in the last 50 years, but the way our field of Chinese legal history was shaped after World War II. I want to show that there was a resistance to unlimited rulership, that the ruler in the legal system played two roles as head of the bureaucracy and head of clan. And finally, I wanted to end with constraints on the ruler, the imperial women and heavenly revenge. I am using a thin version of the rule of law today with emphasis on legal equality. In the abstract for this workshop, Peter Bond commented that in the Roman legal system, and I quote, the prince was not bound by laws, unquote. My pre-recorded talk follows his presentation, so I cannot respond until our joint session, but I hope that we can offer some comparative insights. It was after World War II that the field of Chinese studies emerged as an academic discipline. The Nuremberg trials in 1946 revealed that holding ruling elites accountable for the law was not sufficient to guard justice for the laws conserve immoral ends. As the Cold War geared up in the 1950s and a communist leviathan based on Marxist principles loomed, the example of sage rulers and ministers inscribed in the ancient Chinese texts appealed. The legalists became the villains, the architects of unfettered monarchy. Moreover, some eminent thinkers in the U.S. believed, as did Weber, that the Chinese were incapable of a transcendent philosophy that would allow them to conceive of a view of the world that would subordinate the ruler to any higher power. Most of the excavated materials removed from sites since the late 1970s deal with law on the ground from the late warring states through the early Han. We now know that the state attempted to intervene in all levels of society, controlling bodies, harvesting resources, a measure of predictability might have offered some relief for commoners, 
officials were given strict guidelines for deciding, implementing, and reporting punishments. We also know that the Han claim to legitimacy as a simplifier of laws was propaganda, and that the laws of the fallen Qin were preserved and augmented. Because next sessions of this series will deal with these issues, I want to turn today to my own interests, the more theoretical materials that have challenged our views of law and ruling. I want to add a bit of personal information about the impact of one of the new texts. In order to pay tribute to a teacher who helped me at a critical time in my professional life, and it advised me about the dangers of putting too much emphasis on new materials. It was 1974 and I was working on a dissertation at the University of Michigan focused on the conflicts between legal reformers and early Confucians. One day I picked up a copy of the archaeological journal Wenwu and turned to its presentation in modern Chinese characters of one newly discovered silk book. This was taken from tomb three at a site in Mahuangdui, Changsha. These materials had come out of the ground a year before, and though the authorship and dating of the materials had been contested, they were buried with the son of a high-ranking official in 168 BC, during the reign of Han Wendi. I remember how surprised I was when I began to read the first sentence of the Jingfa. The Tao gives birth to the law. I had never thought of law as anything more than an instrument of punishment, and here it was linked with the Tao, a principle related to non-action in the natural world, one that subordinated the ruler to a force higher than his will and separated the ruler's interest from the public welfare. This new text was different from anything I had ever read. It takes the Tao as the source of law and it warns the ruler not to transgress it. He is given the power to establish law, but not to oppose it. The constant rotation of the four seasons nature serves as a guideline for predictable governance. There is little attention to human agency. I was fortunate to be able to work with Professor Tian Yu Ching at Beijing University in 1979. He had been reading and annotating the Jingfa, the text that most intrigued me. The timing in which this text appeared mattered. These materials entered the academic world in China during the anti-Confucian pro-legalist movement and followed a period of fairly open discussion about the rule of law in China. This was not that long after the end of the lawless cultural revolution, and at Beida some of our teachers were just back from the countryside and I inserted the photo on the top of one of my language teachers who told me that she used the anti-Confucian campaign in her study groups with her husband to criticize him for his feudal attitudes about housework. And at the bottom here is Professor Tian and two men who I don't remember. Professor Tian and I never discussed current politics and we stayed in the distant past, but it was also clear that he found hope for a legitimate role for law in the tradition. It was a privilege to watch this scholar create a commentary on a new text. And he pointed to passages from trans transmitted texts that resonated with the Jingfa. He also warned me not to see it as a product of an eccentric writer, but to place it in the context of familiar transmitted works. In particular, he pointed to passages on law in the Guanza, a late Warring States eclectic text. Professor Tian gave me the annotated text to take home and I joined a class at Harvard with Robin Yates and watched a second commentary develop as we read the text in his seminar and then he translated it. New materials have stimulated a revision of familiar texts and of the legalists in particular. As I went back to the writings of Shang Yang and Han Fei, I began to think that they were not advocating an ideology of despotism, but searching for measures to separate the good of the state from vulnerable and incompetent rulers. A century before Han Fei, Shang Yang supposedly declared, an intelligent ruler is cautious in regard to the laws and regulations. He does not heed words not in accord with the law, but conforms with the law. Once the laws are fixed, there is no room for the arbitrary prince. 
True, the legalists were advocates of harsh punishments, but there's little evidence in their writing to support a platonic ideal of unfettered imperial power. Nor did they exclude themselves from bodily harm at the hands of the state, as did their Confucian counterparts. Moreover, rulers assigned the risky job of making and reforming laws to their legalistic officials, most of whom died a violent death. When one of Han Jingdi's favorite officials, Cao Tso, added 30 new statues to the law, he was opposed by the feudal lords and was executed. When in Wu Di's reign, Zhang Tang added the crime disapproval of the heart, a treason law, and removed ambiguities from the statutes, he was forced to commit suicide on the charge that he had often violated the old laws. Of course, court politics played a role in their demise, but it was dangerous business to inf interfere with the privileges of landed families and imperial kin. As for the impact of Huang Lao thought on Han politics, as Leon Kai has shown, we find uh, Huang Lao devotees, especially among empresses, but there was no united political faction with any power. Yet, enshrined in the Silk Books was a celebration of universal clear law strict standards for punishment, and laws the basis for governance, ideals that linked morality with bureaucratic rulership. It is not surprising that the silk books were buried, if not written, during the time of Han Wing Di. As the historians present their version of a model emperor, we can see how the imperial portfolio developed. It was a delicate time. The Han founder had been away from court busy battling his ambitious comrades, his heir was weak, and his consort, though capable, was not a legitimate ruler. Han Wendi was elected by a committee of elder statesmen, though the son of a concubine, supposedly because his mother wasn't a troublemaker. In some ways, this time was a blank slate in which officials and the emperors negotiated their roles. The situation was so fragile that the emperor and some officials had not yet advocated separation ritually from the Qin, and they had kept many of its practices and symbols. When the philosopher statesman Jia Yi tried to argue in favor of this separation, he was punished. Nishijima Sadao shows how the rituals associated with the ancestral cult and head of state delineated the emperor's dual roles. Nishijima focuses mainly on the more systematic rites on the later Han, but they were in place in Han Wendi's reign. Tianzi, the son of heaven, was a rank in the official hierarchy, given soon after the emperor began his business running the state. In this office, he often negotiated with the minister of justice to decide ambiguous cases, and sometimes backed down when the officials warned him of his duty to balance the law with fairness. Huang Di was conferred later after he had demonstrated respect for the ancestral cult and filial duty to the founder. He was in this role most subject to his mother and grandmother. Though the test of virtue had some merits, it also left open the possibility that the notion of virtue could be manipulated. One constraint on imperial power was the threat of revenge from on high, which would be demonstrated by disruption on earth. Much has been written about correlative theory in yin Yang cosmology, and the histories portray emperors as taking disaster seriously. Jiayi's warning is interesting because it presumes that killing one innocent person would result in heaven wrought disaster. And the Huainanza warned oppressive laws and ordinances stimulate plagues of insects, and if the innocent are put to death, the countryside will dry up in drought. It's not uncommon for imperial women to play a role in politics, but I do think it unusual how much in the early Han they intervened in legal matters. Even the powerful Emperor Wu was berated by his mother for sending family members to be tried by the men of the law rather than the clan. Of course, there was more to the story. I wanted to end the presentation with an anecdote from the Han Shu. An heir who violated the 
rules of behavior after taking the title Son of Heaven was dethroned for not behaving as a filial son during the dead emperor's funeral rituals. He had been given the title of Tian Tzu, but not Huang Di. This was a delicate business, for it set a dangerous precedent. As Lian Kai shows, politics were behind this unusual event. But the scene is remarkable, as the 15-year-old Dowager Empress, donned in splendid robes and seated within military-style curtains of state, with several hundred attendants around her all bearing weapon, made her judgment, wearing a pearl-sewn garment for the occasion, pearls, the symbols of water, fertility, female power. All right, I so wonderful for the significant uh, contribution. Uh, talk about you know very engaging picture of the practice or the philosophical aspect of the legal and the legal practice and the legal philosophies in early imperial China. Also, Professor Turner recorded the talk with the help with her darling daughter in advance. Really want to say my sincere thanks for the careful preparations. Now it's time for Professor Bam to present from the perspective of Rome Empire. Uh, I'll be there. Give me a second. Take yes. your time. OK. All right. Well, thank you very much, um, Yang Zai, for inviting me to this, and also to Karen, of course have asked me to contribute to this. Um, um, what I have um, discussed then with Karen, what I could do for this was to try to provide a, a, a broader world history context, maybe some comparative uh, context for, for her reflections on, on the politics and, um, and laws of, um, or, or, and law giving or law, law, law administering process of, of, of ancient China. And I will talk about tribute uh, and talk some more about tribute to empires. And then also, of course, uh, about Rome as the, uh, uh, at least in among Western people, right? Um, it is sort of uh, connected with the notion of law. Rome is the empire of law in the West. So uh, let's start with this. Uh, and But be before we go to this, I also want to say that we're, uh, uh, a very significant concept here will be the notion of, um, of government without bureaucracy, which will gain currency in the Roman studies in the 1980s, and which still has a lot of, uh, to learn to teach us in understanding how Rome actually functioned. So let's start with, um, um, uh, with, uh, with Rome as the empire of law. And um, I have a, one of my favorite passages from ancient Roman authors is uh, that, that of Elias Paterculus, who was a lieutenant, as it were, of the, the um, eventual emperor Tiberius. And uh, he writes a small history telling about also how he'd been campaigning about uh, with, together with Tiberius. He, uh, some of those campaigns took on in Germania. And in that, that connection, he comes to talk about the, um, uh, uh, the um, uh, Varus, who uh, suffered that ignominious defeat in the Teutoburg Forest in, uh, in Germany in 9 CE, uh, which basically put an end to further Roman expansion north of the Rhine. So this is what he then uh, taught, says about com comments about Varus. So this Varus losing that uh, before the defeat, he entered the heart of Germany as though he were going among a people, enjoying the blessings of peace and sitting on his tribunal, he wasted the time of a summer campaign in holding court in observing the proper details of legal procedure. <clears throat> so at least there was one Roman who didn't give much for the notion of Rome as the empire of law. Before Rome was an empire of law and bureaucracy, it was, we always have to remember, an empire of conquest and tribute. Let's try to gain some context on the, the implications of that. Um, Tributary empire, very brief definition, uh, based on military expansion, um, uh, then imposition of taxation or tribute or, on the conquered territories, um, and, um, uh, and um, collected then 
through cooperation with um, local elites. Uh, normally, tributary empires have relatively lean, um, uh, small administrations. They are lean, low-cost arrangements. That's always very important to keep in mind because if they are too um, expansive administratively, um, they risk spending too much money governing instead of gaining, um, uh, what you say, turning a profit on the um, on the um, uh, on the on the conquest. Most of these empires also have a notion of universal rulership. We certainly re recognize that from, from ancient China or, and later Chinese uh, imperial dynasties. Um, uh, government is extended over multiple regional and local traditions. So we have both tribute and universal uh, empire here. Yet when we talk about law and bureaucracy, um, our prevailing, what would you say, theoretical language is one born out of uh, uh, the process of modernization. So we are talking of uh, interested in notions such as bureaucratic intensification, unitary creation of unitary states, and also modern sovereignty. But in a way, extensive uh, territorial empires were very much not unitary, and they were not um, uh, based on, 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 on modern sovereignty, and they were also not based on that bureaucratic intensification to nearly the, extent, uh, uh, the same extent. They were instead uh, aiming for a kind of universal um, uh, hegemony, um, and they collected tribute uh, in a lowly, uh, in that what well, as I call a lean cost arrangement, and they dominated Eurasia for millennia. So this is actually, I would say, this is the context that we need to address our questions of of creations of rule of law. Um, it is not in that uh, modernizing perspective, but more in exactly that uh, ecumenic. Uh, universal perspective of these old empires. Uh, I've done a lot to, to explore this, so I, I apologize for making a small advertisement here, but uh, I never miss a chance to, to mention a couple of books that I've been involved in with some from, some from a huge European research network where we try to explore comparisons and, and track the notion of the universal empire across Eurasia. So if any of you are more interested in this, um, here's at least two, 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 two titles to, to recommend. But basically what happens then, or what, what, to sum it up here, is the, that, uh, that uh, this kind of uh, tributary universal empire um, as a form comes to dominate um, uh, Afro-Eurasia from, uh, from uh, classical antiquity onwards with the creation of the Han Dynasty Empire and the Roman Empire, but also, as you can see on the map here, uh, uh, plenty of um, several other empires in between. And um, this is a, 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 what would you say, a, um, a historical uh, morphology, a structure that simply repeats itself up through a Eurasian history, but it's constantly all expanding. So more and more people come to live under these um, great dynastic or universal realms as a, as a, uh, as European, or sorry, as Eurasian history or Afro-Eurasian history progresses. Um, well, in a way, actually culminating, you could say, with a Qing dynasty empire uh, in the 18th, uh, 18th century. So it is a very broad, expansive, uh, and long history that we should look at uh, our, our problems uh, in. So, but this slide at least is government without bureaucracy. Okay. So what do I mean with, uh, with government without bureaucracy? Um, um, well, um, uh, the, the, that, that notion was introduced to Roman history by actually one of my teachers, um, and the poet uh, Peter Gansi, and, uh, and also his uh, pupil Richard Salop. What they meant about government without bureaucracy is that the number of, of, uh, of administrators actually sent out from Rome, the capital and the uh, court government is extremely small. Um, Rome was an empire maybe of 60 million people and the people who were sent up as top administrators to govern that realm from were, were, were less than 200 every year. So we are, were, were, there were basically 60 provinces, they each had to have a government and they also had a financial officer and a few more others. So you can see it was not very much. It also means that they could not possibly have been controlling what was going on on the ground. There was no way that these people could in fact um, administer uh, the empire. If you um, then look to, um, to other imperial historiographies of these tributary empires, uh, Fahad Hassan on, on the Mughal Empire has added to the notion of government without bureaucracy uh, by notion mentioning that, um, that uh, when you look at Mughal power too, uh, 
and you look at, at the day-to-day -day running of the, the empire, uh, it is very, very difficult to distinguish the local power hierarchies uh, from the state. Um, um, the, 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 the governors and so on sent out from the local court um, were fundamentally dependent on the active cooperation of local communities and their leaders. And in fact, the empire is, if, is, is, if anything, simply appropriated by these local groups to strengthen their positions in society. So what he, he, he talks then about how the center of gravity of power, gravi or how power gravitates downwards in society, that it is in fact actually the local leading groups that are strengthened by mogul power and are taking over um, the empire. And this is in fact the same history that we normally tell of Rome. Uh, the actual administration of the empire is always in local hands. And um, as uh, Roman history develops, the empire is simply taken over by provincial elites. Uh, some of the, uh, the some signs or unmistakable signs of this, of course, is that when you see imperial dynasties beginning to hail from provincial families. But it's uh, but these are but the imperial rulers that were what you say provincials uh, of origin. They are simply the tip of a much larger iceberg, uh, where you see that uh, the, the empire is, is simply taken over by provincial elites. And it ends up, of course, when the, um, in the fifth and sixth uh, centuries, when the Western court has crumbled and it has lost control of its provinces. The only surviving court is in Constantinople, the, the Eastern part of the empire. They still use Latin, but increasingly actually, they um, basically, because these are, um, uh, this part of the empire is controlled by Greek speaking elites elites and they simply take it over and end up calling themselves. So Roman ends up being, you know, um, the Greek elites of the Eastern Mediterranean. They are Romai. Um, this has actually just been the basis of a, a provocative and interesting book by Anthony Caldelis about how exactly um, that um, th this is actually um, almost a Roman nation being created in the, uh, in, in the, uh, under the Byzantine emperors then. So uh, worthwhile uh, th thinking about, but it's a, uh, whether I quite believe that in that, I'm not sure. But uh, the reason why you can even write this book is exactly that the provincial elites simply take over the Roman Empire. That power gravitates downwards. All right, where does that leave uh, law and Roman law, especially in this process? Um, the code effect, it's always, um, one ought always to preface a discussion like that, that with the observation that the codification of Roman law, the creation of what we think about today as the corpus juris civilis, the, the, the big law books, uh, mighty volumes, and uh, these big collections are late products of the Roman state. The, the, the time period that we normally talk about, that this is when Roman is at its height, it does not have these huge codified law collections. It is uh, the, the codification of Roman law comes late in the, uh, in the final one, uh, the Corpus Juris is under Justinian. So where we are talking about the late 520s, 530s um, common era. Uh, so this is in fact the product of the provincial empire. Before that few laws, before, the, before, before you have these big codifications, there were relatively few laws in terms, as, 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 as certainly in terms of general laws, but lots of, of rulings responding to the conflicts of the subjects. So the subjects would seek out governors or, 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 or the emperor and ask for a ruling on, on conflicts or competitions that they were having. And uh, sometimes they were lucky to get a ruling and, and, and these would become like case law um, that you could then cite as president later on to defend whatever you had kind of gotten out of it. So in many respect, law is less in the Roman Empire is less a tool of command uh, than an instrument of elites reinforcing local hierarchies. Um, some of the th things that have come up uh, uh, at the moment in, in, in the discourse among Roman historians and, uh, and legal historians is that, um, um, for instance, if um, uh, a case that is brought to a higher court, that simply often just referred back to the local official. Um, the um, the those high up, they they can't really uh, they don't have the tools 
to implement other decisions than what come up uh, locally. And um, they also don't have the knowledge. So they have to basically rely on, on the local officials. So they simply just send it back, please look at it again. But of course, in the long run, that is producing exactly the kind of thing that Fahad Hassan also imagined for, for, the, um, for the Mughal Empire, that you reinforce local hierarchies of power. Uh, a brilliant book on this problem, or this, uh, this question about referring back is, is Benjamin Killey's book on, 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 on Roman Egypt, which is highly recommended here by. Um, another concept which is coming up often now is, um, I'm almost done. Uh, uh, cases um, uh, is forum shopping by Karen H Humphreys, where you see then people using that con conflicts in local society, then they try to go to one court uh, but doesn't really um, um, don't succeed there. Then they go to another, or or the uh, or rivals then go to another court. So they try to sort of um, play out the courts against each other. But again, they are basically using these courts then in their local power struggles. One of the best examples that we know of is the Babatha archive. Uh, to, or be, 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 one of the best, perhaps, what you could say, illustrations of the the power of local society, even though it has been often thought of in different ways, is the Babatha archive. This is an archive of uh, juridical texts or of personal texts, um, with sort of like property deeds and so on, uh, from a Jewish woman uh, from, uh, from the second, early second century AD uh, or common era. Um, you see that woman you availing herself of, of Roman law. So it looks, ah, oh, Roman law is spreading everywhere and everyone is using it. Well. Um, these documents were found in a cave belonging to those rebel, uh, to the rebels that um, rebelled against uh, Rome under Bar Kokhba. So you can see it's not exactly that Rome is just controlling the lives of these people. Actually, these were active rebels, but they at some point also availed themselves of, 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 um, of these Roman forms to better their position in society. Uh, society. All right, so law, then there's also a moral discourse on kingship you could see in these empires. And I think actually that was very much of what, what Karen's talk was about, that moral discourse on kingship. Um, in Roman uh, cases, um, I would say, I normally uh, say this is like about the respect for the elite or the aristocracy. Also admonitions of fiscal frugality, no new taxes, much more than Bush, they, uh, senior, uh, junior, they believed in no new taxes. And, um, um, because then you will allow the elites a sizable share of the agricultural surplus. Okay, so I conclude now with a question. So if we have the image of Rome as government without or only little bureaucracy, and that image is in fact unexceptional, you can for instance see similar small scale uh, 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 administrations in the Islamic Caliphate or among the Ottomans or the Mughals and many others, you see, um, societies like these, they did produce extensive revenue records, but they all had very lean administrations and they did not produce these unitary and homogeneous administrations that, we have, that our theoretical language has been attuned to reflecting on. Um, so then I have a question that I've sort of, by having to engage also with the early China uh, and the scholarship on early China. Um, why do we think ancient China was significantly different? Because when I lend, read about later Chinese dynasties, like the Qing dynasty, um, then it looks much more like that. Well, not government then without bureaucracy, but uh, anyhow, government with, which had relatively little um, bureaucratic control on the ground, but which was actually run by local elites. So this is the, this is the kind of system that I also find in the um, book on soul stealers. Uh, for instance, Kuhn's book on, on soul stealers. So why do we think that ancient China was different, if it was. Thank you very much for, for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ban, for the wonderful, informative talk. As a historian of early Chinese empires, I can see dramatic difference between the Rome Empire and the Qing Han dynasties. But I will stop here. Uh, Professor Ban, would you please stop sharing? Then oh, we'll yeah, sorry. I thought I actually had. Yeah. Uh, uh, just a moment. Okay. Uh, just a moment. Take your time. There we are. Okay, great.
So now the whole round table belongs to Professor Zhang Taishu, please. Uh, thank you. Um, so first of all, uh, let me thank uh, Liang for organizing this, uh, this wonderful event. Uh, and also thank you to Karen and Peter, uh, Peter whom I've met, the first, met for the first time on Zoom today. Truly a pleasure um, for these uh, extremely thought provoking and informative um, presentations. So my role I think is basically to try to stimulate discussion and to start a conversation. Um, so to that um, go, I've basically just like put together a set of questions um, that are not necessarily all, all, all connected, connected to each other at all. And hopefully we can, in the, in the next, um, is it like 45 minutes or an hour, to, um, we can just talk about these uh, in some detail. Um, let me start with some methodological and conceptual questions, right? So, so the, the first question that always gets asked uh, of this kind of dialogue between say China and the West and so on and so forth um, is almost always like, what's the purpose of comparison? Like, what are we trying to get at by putting these two, two, uh, two political entities and legal entities side by side? Uh, it can't, it, generally speaking, it can't just be that somehow putting them side by side illustrates things um, that we couldn't have observed by by looking at these entities independently. Um, that that's that's often true, but it doesn't seem to be like a strong enough defense um, for the use of the comparative method. Instead, um, if you, if you get down to it, uh, the comparative method seems more likely to be used as a way of, in some ways theorizing, uh, as, as a way of simplification, of abstraction, of structural analysis, and in the end of towards some kind of theoretical construction, uh, which of course is pretty much the exact opposite of how much of modern historiography tends to operate. Modern historiography tends to be skeptical of theorizing and structural analysis and causal analysis and so on and so forth, but it's very hard to justify the use of comparative methods. Um, without saying that the point of comparison is to, so, you know, like one common way to think of the, the, the purpose of comparison is to say, here are these two entities. Um, we're going to find out what's similar about them, what's different about them. And the question then becomes, you know, can we explain things in the latter set? Can we explain things uh, in this set of like, what's different about these two entities uh, by some reference to each other? Which is why, you know, like the, the, the most common comparisons of say China and Europe, Europe are usually concentrated in the, like the, the, the late early modern uh, modern period. Because um, there the driving, the driving question tends to be as Leon points out, the square divergence question of what caused the rise of the West vis-a-vis -vis the relative decline of China. And there, of course, the, the usual move is, you know, here, here is here is this obvious set of economic differences and military differences that are clearly uh, clearly salient and observable from something like 1800 onwards. Um, can these various institutional, cultural, political differences that we also observe in, either in that era or short, or relatively shortly, approximately before that? Uh, can those underlying institutional, political, social differences explain this broader economic difference? Right. So, so not only is there a causal analysis implicit in this comparison, but there's also kind of like an attempt at theorizing both both entities and society and societies. Uh, it is something that's a, that's a little, little bit kind of like more structured and simpler, um, and more theoretically oriented than the usual complexity, um, com complexity and context-oriented historical narrative. Now, if that's the purpose of comparison, as a general matter, the question then becomes, what's the, what's the point um, It's like Han, China versus Rome context, which I think in recent years has become more and more prominent in academia. And of course, in, in some ways, if you observe the way that Peter and Karen have been arguing about this, um, you, you could kind of sense that there are, there are it's not so much for the purpose of explaining divergence or, con or convergence per se anymore, because divergence or, compare or convergence during the Han and Roman eras, the relationship between that and later kind of more historically 
significant divergences is not necessarily that concrete. Um, instead, the purpose of comparison is to, this is, it, it's really kind of like a theory, theory construction at, 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 at a relatively pure level. So the question that Peter seems to ask is, you know, can we build theories of empire, especially can we build theories of early empires based on, like, based on, on, based on this comparison? Is there like a theoretical idea of how empires function, you know, this tributary versus universal distinction that Peter draws? Um, can we use that kind of model to understand some of the differences between Han, China, and, and Rome? Uh, and on the reverse, is the empirical comparison between these two entities informative of the way that we should think about modes of empire, um, modes of like imperial governance? And how should that inform our kind of the theoretical thinking about the, the various structures of, structures of empire? Uh, in Karen's presentation, there seems to be kind of like a broader concern with this concept of law. It goes back to this early, um, this very prominent um, long-standing debate within Chinese law of whether there was such a thing as the rule of law. Um, in the in, in the Chinese context, Karen picks up on the on this. Now, is the, is the, is a is there was there the rule of law in ancient China? That's an empirical question. Uh, but of course, the way that Karen engages the analysis, it also kind of uses the empirical question as a way to reconsider the the theoretical concept of the rule of law itself. Uh, and also reconsider the, the, the functional uses and structural functions uh, of law in this earlier imperial era. Uh, and that all goes to kind of like a deeper conceptual analysis and deeper conceptual understanding of what exactly uh, is the rule of law, what exactly is law properly understood, especially in this early context, and it, like our modern understandings of law still properly applied uh, back in these early historical contexts. And of course, the Roman comparison of you know, formal Roman law versus Chinese rituals or, or Chinese um, laws and, and regulations that further, you know, like the, 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 dif the differences and commonalities between those two sets of legal institutions uh, certainly begs many questions about like how should we properly understand the concept of law and especially how should we properly understand the concept of the rule of law. All right, so, so, so I think like that, that general kind of like somewhat more theory, more theory and, con and concept oriented framing um, seems to be the proper kind of general methodological theoretical framing and posture of this, this comparative exercise and this, this, this conversation that we're having right now. Um, so that leads me to the, some of the more, the more specific conceptual uh, and theoretical questions that I had uh, at listening to these presentations. So for Karen, there's a there's a question of like you know like what is the rule of law, and how how is the the question how is the concept truly useful as a as an analytical tool in these early in, in these early early historical contexts? So the, the the thing that I've always struggled with when people talk about the rule of law in, in ancient China or constitutionalism in ancient China, this is a massive literature, you know, people people. More, more more recently, people like like uh, like Julie have have talked about this extensively. I've never been quite clear on whether we should insist on a conceptual difference between just constraints on power, even transcendent constraints on power, uh, and the rule of law per se. Right. So you can imagine all kinds of situations where there are structured and permanent and reliable constraints on the power of the ruler um, and including ideals of transcendental justice, of metaphysical notions of the heavenly way, of ancestral authority and so on and so forth, right? Um, some of these things are more normative than others. You know, like if, if I think that you know, like the, the, the power of the current ruler is kind of bound actions of his ancestors, that's a, that's a much more normative and transcendent kind of constraint than simply saying as a matter of fact, um, the, the current power of the ruler is checked by the existence of an established aristocracy who jealously protects his own power and exercises uh, functional checks and balances on the ruler's exercise of power. But nonetheless, right, the, 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 there are all these kinds of constraints. <laughs>
that to me don't seem to be necessarily associated uh, with the rule of law, right? Because these kinds of constraints are not necessarily formal in nature, and many of them aren't really normative in nature either. The, and when we say the rule of law, we tend to mean a constraint on power that is both formal and normative. That's what law is, right? Like law is a formal system, law is a formal system of rules uh, that speaks from a position of authority. It's narrow, precise, structured. Um, it's it pre presents itself as internally coherent. That all goes to the formality. And plus, because it speaks from a position of authority, that goes to the, the normativity of law. Uh, and so hence, this is you know, like if you take that point of view of what the rule of law is, it's not quite clear that the constraints of power that you observe in Han China are necessarily rule of law constraints, but they they very often are not necessarily they're they're often not either normative or formal. They're just they just stem from the natural concentration of power and authority by the aristocracy. And it's just kind of like a de facto constraint rather than kind of like a de jure uh, constraint. And even when the constraints are normative, they're presented as normative institutions, um, they may or may not have been formal enough and have been kind of like internalistically self-coherent enough to constitute what we would understand as law. Now, Karen mentions that you know, like there, there are these Han Chinese or, or, or earlier texts in classical Chinese political discourse that talk about you know, fa. But I've always also also had some doubts about whether you know, fa, as spoken of in those kinds of contexts, is, is truly translatable as law. Right? It, it tends to mean something closer to natural law, as like a derivative of the Tao of the way. But then it, it in, in that sense, it seems to mean more something like the proper way of doing things, the proper method of doing things, fa as method, um, rather than fa as law. Um, and if that's the case, um, it's like I, I'm still kind of groping for more concrete proof that there was a formal and normative structure of rules that constrain power, um, that constrain the ruler's power in China, frankly, at any stage. Um, the closest we can get are things like you know, ancestral rituals and so on and so forth. But it's not quite clear how much of an actual check on power and substantive check on power in those kinds of rituals actually constituted. And in, in any case, those kinds of rituals were more kind of like a Song Ming Qing phenomenon um, than they were a Han phenomenon. So th th that all kind of begs the question, when we, like, when, when we say there, there was possibly a rule of law in Han China, what exactly are we talking about? Now, you could say that that kind of like narrow insistence on normative, normativity and formality as components of the rule of law, that's too narrow. And we should understand the rule of law uh, in, in a broader, more functional sense. And that, that's, that's quite fair. But let me also try to defend a little bit the, the, this narrow definition of the rule of law, right? Um, the thing is that, you know, like, if you think about it, the, the idea of like normatively and metaphysically and religiously unchecked power is not a natural phenomenon. It's not a common phenomenon. Uh, in frankly, most pre societies, like most pre societies have a concept of the ruler being bound by at least like some kind of um, religious entity or normative, like normative morality. Um, the idea of like an absolutist unchecked ruler, that's actually quite modern. And it was against that modern ideal of the unchecked ruler that you have the modern ideal of the rule of law, which employs formal, formal, formal and normative rules akin to, functionally akin to law to check that um, absolutist ruler. Um, in the pre-modern world, given that you can have, like given that the, the, the common notion of a ruler was a person who was perhaps not necessarily constrained by formal, formal laws, but was nonetheless constrained heavily by all kinds of ideals, metaphysical perception, or me, um, metaphysical religious, religious uh, beliefs and, and, and entities, it's not quite clear that in that kind of world, you actually need something akin to the rule to basically make sure the power is just uh, in, in, in an unchecked manner. 
So if that's the case, then the, the, the narrower meaning of the rule of law has some virtue and some value in this context. And perhaps there's some value in keeping that, that narrow concept. Now for Peter, um, first of all, thank you for talking about um, the, 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 the Germanic context. I was actually just recently watching this Netflix show called Barbarians, um, which you may or may not have, have watched, which, which made, me, made me feel like highly interested again after. Uh, um, in that part of Roman history. Um, but let me ask you some, just, just, just like one final question about basically the modes of empire. I, 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 I'm completely on board with your distinction between, between tributary and universal empires. In some other contexts, they've been called decentralized versus centralized empires and so on and so forth. Um, but I, I'm a little bit more concerned with the way that you talk about law and its relationship to administration. So, so in your presentation, law is often pitched uh, as in some ways kind of like a corollary to, to administration. And if like in, in, in parts of like, you're kind of like saying that you know, like earlier Rome is a decentralized tributary empire in which most rural governance is, is local and so on and so forth. Later on, it moves more towards the kind of, kind of like a universal mode, and in which case the, 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 central, the central government exercises stronger administrative authority. And as part of that, it begins to pass more laws and rely more heavily on legal institutions. And that may, be, may you, 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 you're obviously much more expert on this than any of us are. And I, I defer to that, but then that, that kind of begs the question of like, what's the, like, what's the relationship between law and administration in this later phase of the empire? Um, especially in some parts of the legal theoretical world, and especially in this like more recent literature on, on authoritarian legality, um, we've tend to, tended to think of like law as something that's not positively correlated to administration, but it actually in, in, in some ways is almost like kind of like negatively correlated to administration. Like law is what you use as a means of control and order um, when you don't have really robust administrative capacities. Um, so, so in some ways, like you know, like law because of its formality, its universalist nature, its relatively cheap enforcement apparatuses compared to on the ground, more minute, detailed, daily governance. Um, you know, compared with day to day governance, day to day administration that's hands on, that's kind of like locally sophisticated, and so on and so forth. Um, yet at the same time, centrally responsive. Um, law is not so responsive to local conditions. It's just kind of like a universal blanket thing the central government passes and imposes. Um, it, it's, a cruder, it's kind of like a cruder tool of control and rule as compared to what we think of as the administrative state. And you know, of course, like you mentioned, you, you, you mentioned, sorry. Uh, Professor, how about in that's wonderful the discussion. I think you posed you know, a lot of questions that two presenters could respond, right? right. So, so how, yeah, how about, you know, you guys action. engage in your conversation? Uh, right. So that, yeah, so okay. I think it's very so, so, clear. So can I, can I just finish this one sentence? Sure. sure. Um, so, so, so if that's the case, right, like that, that at some phase of governance, there's a, there's kind of like a negative relationship between, between the, the reliance on law and the intensity of administration, um, then how should we think of this phase of the Roman Empire where you see kind of like an escalation of both law and administration? Well, one way you could, one, one, one way you could pitch it is that there are actually three phases. So there's a phase in which you're, you're completely decentralized and you just like let, let local, local, local societies govern themselves. Uh, in which case you need neither law nor administration. Then at the other at the other end of the pole, you have intensive hands-on centralized administration that's highly bureaucratic and highly detailed and nuanced. In the middle, there is something of kind of like a legal administrative stage where you want to impose central rule on the on your local on, on your localities, but you don't have enough administrative administrative muscle. Uh, to do that and come like a pure pure governance oriented fashion, and instead you have to rely on more standardized and more universalist rules to do the heavy lifting for you in terms of government uh, in, in terms of control, and that's when you rely on law. So if that's the case, then would then would it be fair to say that, that you know, like the, the later phases of the Roman Empire fall more into this like middle box than they fall into the the more heavily administrative box? on the other end. Uh, so so that, that's all I have. And thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you for Taishu. Uh, you know, let me take advantage of my position as a host 
So I really enjoy the conversation. But I was thinking if there is a you know different levels about our conversation. First is a law as an idea. If the idea would you know present law is supposed to check the power. That's you know the ideal perspective. Another one is an institutional practical perspective, how law was exercised. If this you know practical institutional level could embody a certain philosophical idea of law. So I just, you know, jump into this kind of Tai Shu's uh, comments. I would love to listen to the, you know, conversation of uh, Professor Turner and Professor Bang. Please go ahead. All right. Uh, Karen, will you go first or shall I go first? Or... Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> I agree with Taitsu about the rule of law concept. And I think it is artificial. And much of my work has been in response to Westerners who say there's no rule of law in China, no law in China. I've been to conferences, and Peter was at one where um, we were lining up according to our empires and the guy who does the Holy Roman Empire was first and others and then I because I did China was kind of last because there was still the assumption that China has no concept of law. And of course I'm reacting to this notion of Chinese despotism. And I think what I've done here is what Professor Tian Yu Ching warned me not to do and that is to overreact to new materials. But I, I think and I think Apologists would say that law and ritual often are not separate. And I agree, there were no institutional checks on rulers. I'm not sure if there were anywhere in any uh, early empire. I think the notion of psychic coercion, which uh, Weber uh, mentioned, is extremely important here. So I agree with this uh, that there's no formal rule of law. But the other thing is we are sort of caught in this paradigm. You know, the United States has been exporting rule of law education to China and China is always found deficient. So, and this, this, this talk, I mean, this, this whole cons, this uh, workshop is titled rule of law, but I agree that there's no legal check per se that we can see in the histories on imperial power. So I'll leave it at that. Could, could I add to this, Karen, and, and then yeah. pick up on, on the, uh, the question posed by Professor Taiso. Um, um, one of the reasons why we exactly want to do these comparisons is that as we, we, we sit up now, ending up again discussing was there like um, uh, rule of law in China, just but precisely in the way we imagine that, you know, we valorize rule of law in a particular fashion today, right? So did they also have that in ancient China? or you could say the same when you study the Roman Empire, um, we always end up wanting to, um, in debates about how much the Roman Empire managed to create a modern European state. So the, the whole comparative exercise about trying to re um, um, uh, reach out to, to other empires is, uh, if, when you study ancient history, is exactly to um, liberate ourselves from that uh, master narrative and come up with um, what we say more historically sensitive parallels to our societies. Um, I, I, I totally take on board your distinction, distinction, distinction between um, an analytical comparison and then sort of more traditional historiography. But it, this is in fact one of the things that the more I work on this, I, I have trained as a traditional historian uh, my whole project from the beginning was about understanding the particulars about Roman society. Uh, but the more I worked on this, I realized that um, that our that the mo that the that the divide for historians. So we do real sort of particular history, and then we can learn, let the sociologists do comparisons that are just analytical. Um, um, tends to um, shrink out the histories that we are telling. Because we always think we, when we want to do particular history, we always want to we, we we want to do contextualized history. But the context is almost the always the micro context. The more minute details you can list on a case and block out most of the rest of the world, 
the more learned and better you are in a way. But in fact, um, if we then think about how many people, you know, what they run, run around with in their sort of, you know, mental apparatuses on which they approach them, well then, well, there may be lots of details, but then the only thing we can then ask is exactly, did we have exactly rule of law in the way we understand it today? Or did we, so, um, so we are actually narrowing our stories when we as historians don't think in comparison, not necessarily to do abstract theorizing, but actually to generate better historical narratives and maybe also narratives that are more um, um, uh, alert or aware of macro histories. Why are histories, why are genuine real histories always micro histories? Why are, why is um, uh, bigger developments not better? I, my, let me give you an, um, an anecdotal or analytical example. If we sit in, a, if we all have, we have all tried to sit in a traffic jam, right? Inside the car, a traffic jam is experienced as, you know, stop, go. You know, you're blocked and then all of a sudden you can um, speed up and then you are blocked again. But if you go up on a bridge, which you're sort of over, stands over this road where this happens, you can actually see a wave going through the traffic. Why is that wave any less real than the stop go pattern than you experience? I've never understood, I, I think that this, is, um, this is something historians need to think a lot more about, that, uh, that bigger developments are not necessarily less real. Um, and for instance, um, isn't it like, uh, when we look at the, uh, the uh, formation of the uh, unified uh, Chinese empire around to, well, let's just say 221. Let's not get bogged down into details about how much uh, the Zhou era and so on was before, but just we, 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 we would just start there from, from 221. And more or less at the same time, Rome is in war with Carthage about dominating the Mediterranean. Why is this the case? Um, well, if you look at it in macro terms, you can actually see big empires beginning at this time, uh, time, uh, point, beginning to form across Eurasia. There must be a reason for this. Why, why, why would they not be more separate if it was just analytical, as it were? It's probably something to do with the growth of peasant populations. So state formation is now um, possible in, in wider regions, and therefore you can have uh, big empires forming. Um, but this you would never notice on traditional historiography. So I would actually say that uh, I, I, I absolutely take on board um, your, your view about um, history and, and uh, analytics, but actually uh, the more I go through it, I become, the, the more I work on this, the more I am also convinced about that this, um, um, that this, this sort of distinction is only the first step because comparison is one of the most important tools for historians to generate stories, big stories to detect macro patterns that you would never even emerge um, think about if you didn't do this. Okay, I, course, yeah. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I just want to say for me, comparative history has allowed me to go beyond some of the myths that we see about China. Uh, for example, looking at Roman elites and their attempts to get out of punishments made me go back and look at the Confucians again. The Confucians are seen as the supporters of the people and so on, the benign bureaucrats. But in fact, they formulated a way to get themselves and their kin out of punishments with ranking systems and so on. And it made me look at the legalists in a very different way because they, they believe the law should be applied universally. So I think that when we see other empires, we see what may be particular to the one we're studying and begin to question it. One of the things that I'm worried about now is there's so much uh, material coming out of the ground on local administration and law that we're going to now see the empire as bureaucratized long before it truly was, if it ever was. So for me, it really has shattered some myths that have allowed me to see things in a new way. Can I respond to Tai Su's, you know, wonderful theoretical, you know, challenge or, you know, kind of inquiry about this kind of comparative studies? For my personal, you know, research experience, exactly. Could we, through comparative study, we could contribute to theoretical constructions? So, you know, as a you know, Chinese who pursue Chinese history in Americans, I always, you know, face this kind of quite embarrassing questions. Why, as a Chinese, you become, you know, pursue your Chinese 
research in American university and got to your PhD in the Western universities? But it's actually the answer is quite simple because a lot of theoretical framework we use to study our history is developed by the you know Western Westerners and based on the Western experience. And I really, you know, have some ambitions, but it's not myself could accomplish. I hope it's our, you know, whole generation or several generations could accomplish. Is through, you know, comparative study, we could include Chinese history, Chinese experience as a basis to construct the theoretical framework. So that's Papa Taishu mentioned that. So I just want to echo that. So, you know, that's exactly, we, we need to, you know, historians have a lot of rich materials. So could we introduce or invite uh, the sociologists, the political scientists to listen to us? And we also read their, you know, theoretical books and, you know, contribute a new series. This new theory, not only based on the Western experience, that's first, of course, comparison, you know, as uh, Karen, that it provides a unique opportunity for us to understand some very specific features or common characteristics, you know, in different civilizations. So that's one point I want to say. Second, I really, you know, want to, you know, contribute is, I, I also, you know, uh, respond to Tai Su's question. I think we are not only concerned economic development in historical, trajectory in the West and the, in the East. But how about we also turn to the political history, the you know, legal history, and the idea of law or idea of morality, other aspect to understand, you know, we, we have to acknowledge East and West take totally different trajectories from the beginning to modern day. And I, I really love Tai Su's book. Actually, it's, from, it's not purely from the development of scientific knowledge or technology to understand the great divergence in modern day, but instead from the, you know, the legal or you know, legal regulations or from the uh, kinship perspective to understand you know, the different historical courses there. Okay, I will stop here. So, so can I just jump back in here for a second? Um, which is that, like, I, I, I quite agree with everything Peter and Karen just said, and I think those, those are all incredibly um, valuable, valuable perspectives and, and examples on, on why, why we do comparison. But, like, I, the way that I've understood, um, I've tended to, to understand that kind of perspective is that the exercises that Peter and Karen just illustrated are actually examples of like intellectual and um, analytical narrowing. So to use Peter's example of you know, like we recognize that actually there is this 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 um, this this not quite coordination but there's this broad temporal coincidence commonality between patterns of imperial rise and falls and state building and economic development and so on and so forth across Eurasia. Um, to me, that's. And that, that's certainly kind of broadens our, our perspective and narrative perspective from one from from one point of view, but from like a from kind of like an analytical perspective, that seems to narrow the range of possibilities if we want to explain, say, you know, like why did Han China behave like this in a political sense, or so on and so forth. Um, without the comparative perspective, you could raise all kinds of issues, um, you know, social, cultural, political, various kinds of military contingencies economic, ecological, and so on and so forth. But if you observe it in, 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 in conjunction with what's going on at the other end of Eurasia, and you believe empirically that these things are kind of synchronized in a relatively rigorous, strong fashion, then that demands an explanation that can actually account for the synchronization. That to me limits the range of possible explanations that we can give for this, this phenomenon, even as it kind of expands the scope of our narrative itself, right? So from a narrative perspective, I, I completely understand why this is an act of broadening, but from kind of like an anal analytical explanatory perspective, I tend to think of it as kind of like a more, more of an exercise uh, in structural thinking and, and kind of like relatively more narrow theorizing. Um, on, on Karen's example of like myth busting, I completely agree that, that that's one of the great virtues of comparison. 
But if you think about it, busting, myth busting is an act of showing commonalities, right? It's, a, it's an act of basically showing that um, the, the kind of myth, myth busting that, that you illustrated, it turns out that frankly, China at this point was not any less like legally oriented or politically structured than say the Roman empire or so on and so forth. Um, that again begins to narrow the ways in which we can actually understand um, the Chinese phenomenon because without that observation, we can understand the Chinese phenomenon as perhaps something that's specifically culturally contained to China or so, or so on and so forth. But with the, the broader, broader explanation, you're, you're forced to think in more generally applicable kind of functionalist terms that transcend these, these, these parochial cultural boundaries that many people have set for China. Right. And so in both those senses, it's an, like both of those examples to me are, are, are examples of kind of like the comparison actually leading to a narrow possible range of understandings and explanations for historical phenomena. Well, I mean, Mm -hmm. But I don't necessarily think that um, this could, this is a, to me, that's a very theoretical uh, take on because, you know, if you look at what he's actually written about these societies, um, um, one of the things which is exactly um, uh, notable uh, when you actually, when you read the different historiographies is that historians do tend to uh, subscribe to the same historiographical um, tropes and, and figures. And as Karen says, for instance, uh, uh, people will come to, to or also Liang Zai says, people will come to ancient China with um, a, a set of um, relatively narrow range of Western developed models and apply to them. And as a Roman historian, my, my problem has been exactly the same, that uh, um, uh, the Western, what to say, sovereign nation state, whatever you want to call it, bureaucratic state, was developed in rejection of the Roman model. But somehow then Roman historians constantly find obliged, find themselves obliged to show that these models could then be used to structure our study. But they, but, but the, theoretically they were defined as the uh, rejection or absence of Rome. So it's not very, so actually it's, it's like, I always say it like this, uh, the Euro Roman Empire is too big to shoehorn into that European model. So I think in practice, it is a widening um, because the, in, in practice, historians are not just infinitely imaginative. Um, they actually subscribe to a, a rather limited range of models. So we, I, I, would, I would claim that in practice, it broadens it. And then there's a the question, of course, about explanation. Is it reductive to do macro history? Well, if you only do macro history, that is, of course, reductive, just as, by the way, I think also actually sometimes we forget it, micro history is also very reductive. It, it, it tends to reduce everything to a particular archive and then everything is, you know, the archive that historian, um, you know, just happens to work on. And then everything which is that archive has to be told but everything else blocked out. That's also a kind of reductive, uh, reductionism, but we just tend not to talk about that. Um, but history should go on on several, many levels. A good historical explanation of, uh, of history will combine. So, um, so for instance, of course, if you just want to say, well, lots of growth of peasant societies and therefore you can have state formation, so you have big empire, that, so that, and that's the end of it. Of course, that would be reductive, but you could combine both um, particular regional perspectives with broader, and in, in, as you do that, I actually think you enrich the story, you expand the range of things. Um, and, and sometimes also, uh, particularly as ancient historians, and I think that, that goes both for, for, for Roman historians or Chinese historians or people working on things in between. Um, we are so philologically, um, uh, what do you say, focused because uh, simply the mastery of the languages and the text takes up so much time and space even to get to that. That sometimes we also need to remember that, um, that, um, that life is not often based on very simple things and not just uh, very minute differences of interpretation in semantic differences between words and so on, that what life is not simply words, but there's lots of you know, basic things that are relatively simple um, that end up 
um, structuring your life, even though you don't realize it before, after you've seen it. So I think also there's a, um, so simplicity in historical explanation is not simply a, a, a advice to be rare, to, to, to be frowned upon. It's also something which we sometimes, especially when we are so textually focused as we are uh, working on the ancient world, also have to think about. Um, so uh, let me just think, I, I, I could not agree with you more, especially on, on, on that latter point. Um, the way that I would think about your, um, the, the first point that you made is, I would tend to think the fact that historians bring certain kinds of pre-conceptualized biased narratives into their work, I think that shows right off the bat that there's no such thing as like a, a like a theoretical or non-theoretical history. Like you always have theoretical prior, priors. Like the only question is whether you acknowledge them or not. Um, and so, so the, the, the in, in some ways, like the question then is like, you know, the choice is not between a, a kind of like theoretically unconstrained, thick, fully expansive narrative history uh, and kind of like a more narrowly constrained theoretical comparative history or whatever. Um, the choice is between one kind of theoretically influenced narrative and another kind of theoretically influenced narrative. And the only real question is how rigorous is the, th is the theoretical thinking behind the narrative, right? And, and, and in some ways, you know, like the, the point of comparison then is just to like make sure that the, the way that you theorize and the way that you understand the, the, the causal mechanisms or the structures um, has a, broader empirical foundation. And in, in that sense, like, I, I completely agree. It is an act of empirical broadening, but at the same time, it's an act of analytical and theoretical narrowing of the better kind as compared to simply just having a bias of what China ought to look like and then carrying it into your, 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 your narrative history. Like, frankly, I've never really been able to understand the claim of some historians that historians don't do theory. Like, I, I don't think it's possible to construct a, a, a historical narrative of any kind of significance, even from, even from micro historians. The minute they want to argue about the significance of their micro narrative, they are engaging implicitly in some kind of, in, in, in some kind of theorizing. Like, all that really matters is whether you openly acknowledge it or not, and whether you, you, you can actually lay out in more concrete, crystallized, clear steps, what your theoretical thinking and biases and intuitions actually are. And in some ways, the, the point of comparison then should be to help you kind of like narrow in and, and crystallize the proper ways to theorize. Yeah. So the audiences start to post questions. Uh, so one of the questions actually is very uh, inspiring. So also that's one of my concerns. Uh, tai Shu gave a wonderful definition about the rule of law, very clear. But for me, it's also what thinking also is that uh, one of the uh, audiences called the Zheng Xiaowei says, is it possible, you know, that our, you know, new experience, historical experience in Rome, you know, re-examine the historical experience in Rome and the, historical experience in the early Chinese empire could help us to expand the definition or the working definition about the rule of law. I think that's also, you know, I kind of make some twist about the title, you know, of the round the table, right? You know, I said rule of law, you know, I could avoid use that, but I intentionally, you know, kind of misuse this then understanding of rule of law. You know, like Peter Ban talk about, it's not really check on power. It's use law as, you know, practical tools to control. And, you know, Karen talk about actually China, you know, always, you know, identify as an empire without the ideas about use law to check on power. But in, on the opposite, we have theoretical, very theoretical development to use those Tao or transcendental or, you know, principles or law to check on the absolute power. So my, you know, let me summarize this. Is that possible? Is that possible that we redefined the rule of law? I know there is a rule by law, right? So already confusing. But my fundamental question, is that possible? We revise the, those some conceptual frameworks. For example, another one is religion. I always tortured, right? What is Confucianism? Confucianism is not a philosophy. Confucianism is not a religion. Confucianism is nothing. It's a master according to the definition given based on Western experience. 
So, you know, that, that you know, I, you know, throw out this question with, you know, uh, in combination of our audience's questions. Also, the, uh, the Zhang Xiaowei, you could identify yourself who also talk about the natural law. Oh, you guys, everybody could talk, uh, look at those questions. Uh, yeah, so my question is, I, I hope to hear everyone's working definition on the rule of law. I want to hear Karen's working definition, Peter's definition, because Taisu gave a very clear definition on the rule of law. Okay, so that's the question. Okay, uh, I, I, I agree it's a problem because even in the West, the definition is contested and the utility and the morality of the rule of law is contested. So there's no single definition even in the West. Mm -hmm. But what I did was I started reading again, comparatively looking at Greece and Rome and thinking of, of, of possibilities to define the rule of law that would come out of their experience rather than to take a, a definition and impose it. And so I kept it very clear, uh, legal certainty and uh, the, the concentration of, of force in the state. And I narrowed it down to the uh, equality before the law and especially the ruler's equality because I think that's the bottom line. We know the difference between rule of law and rule by law. We know that this is about mm -hmm. the elites being subordinated to a higher authority. So uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's how I come to my definition. Thank you. Definition of rule of law. Well, uh, first of all, I, I would actually say that uh, 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 Tai Su's definition. Um, um, I don't think I, um, I, I would uh, tend to agree with that. Uh, that this is the uh, this is basically the ideal typical definition of what we would say if we in the mass narrative that uh, the Western narrative about the rule of law. So in that respect, I would totally buy into it. But it just does not then. Um, uh, it, may, it may not then, as Karen says, um, may not be very. Um, um, it's not tailor-made for the Roman Empire. Let's just say, like, <clears throat> because I don't think uh, that would, we would, that was a lot, huge, very powerful legal profession for, for a long time that cultivated Roman law and saw Roman law as the guarantor of this. But I think that was mostly. Uh, uh, I don't think anyone really would want to subscribe to that story anymore. Um, so what then we, do we do? Well, um, maybe I tend to do, do, the, do the opposite of Karen there. I, if I were to then come up with a definition of the rule of law, if, though I'm not really sure I want to describe the Roman Empire as the rule of law empire. Um, rule, law, law was something which contributed to rule, but I don't think it was a rule of law empire. But it might be something about elites being able to, um, um, to accumulate um, traditions of uh, legal privilege that they could then, to some extent, not completely, because they, they, the, Rome, the, the emperor is never bound by the law if he decides he's not, but at least they would be able to have something to appeal to and would often be able to make the emperor, because he also wants to look like a nice chap, um, um, accept it and therefore accept some constraints. It might be also something, for instance, like the right of the Senate, that if you have a governor who's governed a province, um, um, the Senate then, and, he, and the provincials then complain that he has been plundering them too much. Um, uh, the Senate then has the right to hear his case, not the Empress simply alone. Uh, 